Jeremiah chapter 12 and 13. I took this from the case for Christianity. It's a little quote that says, Badness is only spoiled goodness. And you have to kind of think about that for a second. Badness is only spoiled goodness. Now, if that's true or not, I don't know as, as I thought about it, because are there anybody that's good? You know, not really. Uh, is goodness really spoiled by, by badness? You know, yeah. You know, any, any good that's in, a, in an individual can be spoiled by badness that's around them. At, at this point, we continue on from chapter 11 and looking at Jeremiah who felt threatened uh, by his family as he was the messenger giving the message that God had given to him and his own family threatening his very life. And we talked in detail concerning uh, family and how the Bible has taught that, that family will come against us, uh, will not like the message that we have and so forth. Jesus spoke about it, the apostles spoke about it, and we see examples of it in, in the Old Testament and, and so forth. And it was really interesting that as I gave the message last week, I, I just thought that it was something that might offend some people, but in reality, I got a lot of good feedback because people really related to the fact that uh, they had struggles with their own family. You know, um, even now, today, because of their Christianity, because of the moral values that they hold, and so forth. And so it still goes on today. And Jeremiah's dealing with it here, where literally they want to take his life. And, you know, we have to understand that it is not the messenger that you're arguing with. It is the message that you're arguing with. I'm just the deliverer of the truth. I thought it was interesting as I was, I was meditating upon this, uh, <clears throat> how those that take the message of God and they preach it, and yet it is not the, necessarily the message, but the messenger that they attack and, and they persecute. When they're only taking a message, it's not even theirs. It's God's message. Um, and at one point in their life, probably unless they were raised in the Christian home, at one point they didn't even agree with that message. But they come to know Christ, gave their life to Christ, become born again, and all of a sudden that message that has been around for thousands of years becomes their message. And then they share that message, and then they get persecuted for their beliefs. But it's not their beliefs, it's God's word, it's God's message, it's God's truth. And we have to understand that even while in church, that as the message is going out, it is not my message and it's not my belief. It is, is it's not what I think is right or wrong. It is what God says in his word that you have to look at and you're challenged with. Uh, years ago, I had someone come up to me and, and ask me um, what I do when I am confronted with someone that has some issues with me. <clears throat> and I said, I, I do two things. I ask myself first, are they true? You know, is any of those issues true at all? And then secondly, I thank them for that. And then I go and I pray to the Lord. And if they're not true, I just disregard it. I just throw it by the wayside. And I, I just leave it there. I don't go to them. I don't need to go to them. They don't need me to be accountable to them. I'm accountable to God. And so... um that's how I handle the message coming at me. Is the message true? And is it something that I do? And is it something that I can correct? And if it's not, and I can judge my own heart righteously, then I can also throw it by the wayside and know that it might be frivolous or some sort of thing like that. And so because of this family issue that Jeremiah has, and, and like us, um, all these questions arise. And I'm sure that you have questions like, why, God, do I have so much trouble in my family? Why can't we just get along? Why can't we just love each other, you know, support each other? I mean, isn't that what family does? You know, my, my son, oldest son, who's not here, made a comment the other day that he loves it when uh, we gather together as a family and my second son does worship uh, along with Rosalind, and we all kind of just do worship songs and sing. And he goes, I really enjoy that so much. I, I love it when we, we gather together and worship our Savior together. And we don't do that uh, very often, usually in Christmas and special occasions, or when we go up to, to Bishop as a family, uh, and we group up there in the cabin, and we sing songs and just have a good old time. And it's just nice to see that everybody is getting along, and everybody is just worshiping the Lord. And you know, But that's not the case all the time. 
You know, it just doesn't happen. You know, there's, there's problems. And of course, the questions come up. And so Jeremiah here has a question for the Lord uh, concerning the wicked. And God will give him an answer. So why do the wicked prosper? Here's Jeremiah speaking in verse 1. Righteous are you, O Lord. Now, let's stop there just for a second. Uh, there's a lot right there in that one phrase. Uh, righteous, when he's talking about righteous, righteous, he, he's not talking about uh, um, necessarily something that has been imputed to God or that God earned or anything. It, it's his very nature. And there are certain things that, that is the nature of God that are uncommunicable to us, you know, uh, to be omniscient, to be all, all, you know, omnipresent. Those are uncommunicable attributes of God that we can't have. You know, but we ha- can have righteousness to a certain degree, but God is righteousness. Uh, John 3.16, God is love. And so if he's love, then we know that he does everything out of love. He doesn't do anything out of anger. He doesn't do anything out of frustration. He doesn't do anything to get back at us. It's all out of love that he does what he does. And so we know he's love. We also know that he's just if God is just, then when something happens uh, in his judgment, we know it's a just judgment. He's fair. Not only is he fair, he knows the actual heart of an individual. And so he judges fairly and righteously and justly. And so he's righteous here. In, in other words, God is fair. God is fair at all times. And so Jeremiah recognizes that first of all. And it's good to start a, a prayer that way or if you have a struggle to always recognize who God is. Now, God, I know you're loving completely loving and I know you're good and I know you're fair you're righteous and so as I come before you it's not necessarily attitude of you know a negative attitude or in a negative way saying if you're righteous why is this happening you know not in that way but acknowledging the fact that he is righteous and that he is his his lord and so it's more of an agreement as he says this statement he says when i plead with you and 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 you see his heart there he's pleading with god Uh, this really affects him Uh, this is his family this is his community and it affects his heart deeply and so he pleads with him yet let me talk with you about your judgments why does the way of the wicked prosper why are those happy who deal so treacherously uh, doesn't it seem like uh, those that um, deal with people treacherously like it? <laughs> they just love to watch someone get killed. Uh, they love to have the upper hand over someone. Uh, my boss, who I worked for probably for a good 10 years, uh, he used to always say, I don't get mad, I get even. And he, and he would say it with a straight face. He goes, I'm not mad, I'll get even. You know? and, and, and he loved to get even. I mean, he was, <laughs> he was an evil person. Uh, he was very prejudiced against African Americans, against Hispanics. He belonged to the uh, Masons. Uh, that was his religion, wore his little ring and so forth. And, and he just had these certain rules that, that he followed. And he enjoyed doing what he did. He loved playing games on people. There was one time when he had done this to a friend of mine where he was following him around in his company truck and and while the friend went uh, out to spot the job that he was doing this boss came to his vehicle checked the doors one of his cabinets were open so he lifted it up pulled out his test equipment and took off with it And, and the guy came around the corner and he saw him like what is he doing he's taking all the test equipment out of my truck you know and so he just stood there watched him and then uh the boss just drove off well because of uh, this happening all the time. Uh, this guy decided, well, I guess he doesn't want me to work today, so I'll just go and take care of some business. <laughs> so he just went through the rest of the day just taking care of business, got in at the afternoon like he normally does, and the boss came up and said, oh, hey, how you doing? I mean, just with a straight face, how you doing? Well, I'm, I'm all right. How are you? <laughs> he says, oh, I'm okay. So how was work today? It was fine. He says, well, I, I really didn't work because you took my test equipment. I saw you take it out, so I figured you gave me the day off. <laughs> and he's just like, ah, you know, I don't get mad. I get even. And, and he did, you know, he did. But it just seems like the wicked prosper. 
Uh, we look at our world today, and doesn't it seem like the wicked prosper? You know, they're always gaining more money. The rich get richer and so forth. And I'm not talking about Christian prosperity. I'm talking about uh, evil prosperity. Why do they prosper is this, this question here. Uh, you have planted them. Yes, they have taken root. They grow. Yes, they bear fruit. You are near in their mouth, but far from their mind. But you, O oh Lord, know me. You have seen me, and you have tested my heart towards you. Now, obviously, these are his countrymen, their fellow Jews, and these men believe that they know God. And so what he's saying here is, is that, yeah, you planted them, and they've taken root, and they're growing, and they bear fruit. At least they think they bear fruit, but you are near in their mouth but far from their mind in other words it is a religious relationship and not a born again experience with god where they desire to please god and there's a big difference there as believers and he says it in verse three you know me lord and you have seen me and you have tested my heart towards you jeremiah's heart was tested by God and it was a heart that loved God so much so that he was willing to obey God no matter how silly the situation next chapter we'll see that God's going to ask him to do something uh, that's unusual and he was willing to do it you see that with Ezekiel Uh, all the strange things that Ezekiel had to go and do play with the mud and that make little figures and so forth you know and then Isaiah the same thing it is a heart that is born again, that, that has been created anew, and a heart that is bent towards God, that is willing to say, though I don't understand it, though I, might not dis- though I may disagree with it, I'm going to do it because it pleases you, Lord. Because it is what you have commanded me to do as a believer. Isn't that what happened with the seven churches when God began to deal with the seven churches in Revelations chapter 2 and 3? And he began to say, I know your works. I know your works. I know your works. He knows the heart. And if he knows the heart, we need to deal with the heart of the matters. But he says, pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. Now he gets a little... I guess he was a little upset here, you know. I mean, they want to kill him, so he's, he's pleading to God, why don't you take care of them for me? Uh, how long will the, will the land mourn and the herbs of every field wither? The beasts and the birds are consumed for the wickedness of those who dwell there, because they said he will not see our final end. Isn't that interesting? That in their hearts, God doesn't see me. He won't judge me. Uh, we'll touch that on that a little bit later so God answers him in verse 5 if you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you then how can you contend with horses now that's an interesting answer (laughs) wait a minute that's not what I asked you (laughs) sounds like Nicodemus right Lord you know I've got some questions for you okay Nick you must be born again in order to get into the kingdom of God. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I, that's not the question I had. He got right to the heart. What God is saying here to Jeremiah is, look, Jeremiah, if you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, in other words, here you're dealing with this situation with your countrymen, with your family, uh, and you're preaching this message and it's tiresome, it's, it's worrisome, and you may even feel a little threatened by it all. You're, you're wearied from it all, yet, then how can you contend with the horses? In other words, there's something greater coming down the road. His name is Nebuchadnezzar, and he's going to send Babylon, and he's literally going to take you captive. So if you're running with the footmen, how can you contend with the horses when they come, when the battle will really be intense? One of the purposes of trials and struggles that we have in life are to prepare us for the greater trials and struggles in life. And as you get older, and some of us are a lot older, it seems like those trials get stronger and greater in life. Me and Randy were, were talking back there a little bit about that. He just brought up the, that, to, that topic, you know, of, of they all, they're faithful to come, trials. And I almost said, yeah, and as you get older, they get stronger <laughs> as they come. You know, we get older and our bodies begin to, to break, you know, and, 
and so forth. My, my pain, and I know some of you have chronic pain. Mariana has chronic pain. Fausto has chronic pain. I have chronic pain. You know, and you deal with it every day, every day, every day, every day, and it's on your mind, and, you know, and it's just something that, that is there, and you have to bear through it. You have to grit your teeth at times, and you have to ask God for strength and um, the ability to persevere and grace and all those things that you need. Um, those little trials that you're going through now, they're preparations for big ones that may come later and down the road. You mean there are bigger ones? Yes, there are. And God is, God is working in you something wonderful in order for you to, to flower at that point. You know, kind of like a um, cocoon in a sense. You know, you get that, that uh, caterpillar, I'm trying to think of the word that they use to, to describe it, and it becomes a, a liquid as it concludes itself, or it covers itself with silk and so forth. And then as it's going through all that metamorphosis and it breaks through its shell, it, it metamorphoses into a beautiful butterfly. Uh, at that point, when it starts to break through, that is the hardest struggle of the whole scenario of him becoming a butterfly. He's got to use all his strength and force. In fact, that is what really makes him the strongest to survive is his struggle to break through there. And so as God is working in us, and though it seems like it's very difficult and wearisome, we're just walking with the footman. And, and as our world, and we see what's going on today, is getting worse, especially for Christians and for pastors. They will be the first ones uh, to be attacked because they are the shepherds. And if you can slay a shepherd, the sheep will scatter and the sheep will be next. And so they're really focusing on pastors. They are coming up with plans. They are scheming and looking for opportunities. They will go into churches and they will literally lay out a plan for that church to destroy it. Um, don't be surprised if men and women come into the churches and then they ask if they can be wed under that church and then when they're told no because of their situation, they're going to sue that church. Don't be surprised if that happens. Or pastors who preach on certain subjects ask for their sermons and that's already happened. Canada, you can't even mention certain subjects. Otherwise, you can be fined or thrown into prison. And so it's getting there. And we're going to see more of it. And so uh, that's his answer. He doesn't really answer them. He says, look, you're having problems now. We'll wait till it comes. So bear up. Trust in me. And, and you will get through this. And if in the land of peace in which you trusted, they weary you, then how will you do in the flood plains of the Jordan? For even your brothers, the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. Yes, they have called a multitude after you. Do not believe them, even though they speak smooth words to you. I find that interesting. I, I've dealt with that so much, um, just being a leader of, of a church, those who come after you. His brothers literally got a mob to come after him. And, and then they're speaking these flowery words, you know, that, that are just so smooth. And, and God is saying, look, don't believe them. Don't, don't trust in them. You just lay your, your trust in me completely. I mean, really, when you deal with these type of situations, there's really not much you can do. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We have to get on our knees in prayer. And from my experience... And I learned this the hard way because I've tried to fight it in my own strength. I have learned now to just shut up and just pray and trust in the Lord. Don't lean to my own understanding. And He'll acknowledge my ways or acknowledge His ways, you know, and He will direct my path. And so I've learned just to do that because it's a waste of time to argue with somebody that's not listening. And it's just leave them to the Lord and just trust in them. You know, that's probably the safest thing to do in that relationship and probably probably the most uh, victorious way of getting at them because you let God do that work in their lives and not your work. And so I've just, <clears throat> I just noticed that when, when, when people come against you, just, okay, it's wonderful, okay, I, I hear you, you know, and you just don't say anything. 
You know, first of all, they shouldn't be doing that. <clears throat> That's unbiblical. Now, there's a process, you know, that they should go through. And so right off the bat, they're already wrong. You don't even have to listen to it. I, I remember when um, somebody years ago came to me <clears throat> and they uh, had an issue with me. And I was an elder at the time. And so they came to speak with me and they said, um, and they weren't, they didn't, I'm sorry, they didn't have the issue. Someone else had the issue. And so th- this uh, person came to me to speak with me. And I said immediately, I said, hang on. I said, stop. First of all, it says, do not bring an accusation against an elder lest there be two witnesses. So where's your other witness? And they got frustrated. They said, what? I go, well, it's, it says it right there in the Bible. He goes, what? And they got really upset. And they went to the pastor. And they told the pastor, he wouldn't even listen to me. You know, da, da, da. He goes, well, what did he say? Well, he quoted the scripture about having two witnesses. Well, he's right. So if the other witness isn't willing to go, then just forget it. Don't worry about it. If he's willing to go, then go with the witness. But if he's not, don't worry about it. And that's how you need to approach those things. Just, hey, the Bible says this. And so I don't even want to hear it if you don't have another witness here. No. Just trust in the Lord. Leave it in his hands. Listen to Jeremiah, or <clears throat> listen as he felt like his house was, was left, as God speaks here in, in verse 7. I have forsaken my house, I have left my heritage, I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hands of her enemies. My heritage is to me like a lion in the forest. It cries out against me, therefore I have hated it. My, her- my heritage is to me like a speckled vulture. The vultures all around are against her. Come, assemble all the beasts of the field. Bring them to devour. And so what he's saying there as far as the speckled vulture, meaning the weaker bird, he, he, he says they're like a weaker bird and the vultures are going to come and they were going to devour that weaker bird. He goes on, Many rulers have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my... A pleasant portion, a desolate wilderness. They have made it desolate, desolate. It mourns to me. The whole land is made desolate because no one takes it to heart. The plunders have come on all the desolate heights in the wilderness. For the sword of the Lord shall devour from one end of the land to the other end of the land. No flesh shall have peace. They have sworn wheat but reaped thorns or sown wheat and reap thorns they have put themselves to pain but do not profit but be ashamed of your harvest because of the fierce anger of the lord so again god just through jeremiah reminding them that because of their idolatry because of their sins god is bringing judgment upon them thus says the lord against all my evil neighbors who touch the inheritance which i have caused my people israel to inherit behold i will pluck them out of their land and plucked out the house of Judah from among them. Um, Then we see the restoration. Then it shall be after I have plucked them out that I will return and have compassion on them and bring them back, everyone to his heritage and everyone to his land. That's really God's heart is restoration. He's always about restoration. And there's different phases of that restoration that can take place obviously restoration needs to take place immediately if you can have that restoration but if it doesn't take place immediately then there's a process that that people have to go through to get to the point of restoration because until they realize um, what they have done and how they have sinned against the lord then um, they can't be restored yet and there has to be an admittance and a confession of that before God can bring about that restoration. And it's a whole process. It takes time sometimes. I mean, years ago, someone uh, very, very well-known individual um, was a part of this whole um, <clears throat> situation that wasn't really too good. And, and that individual ended up joining Calvary Chapel, <clears throat> and Chuck actually began to restore the individual and it took quite a few years and some other Calvary chapels were a little upset that they would that Chuck would take him in uh, to Calvary Chapel and then begin this this process of restoration Um, but 
the individual actually went through this process and it took years before this individual now and today he's on the radio and and, and he teaches and and just great teacher Chuck just couldn't see see um having someone like that um, just fall by the wayside he had he was just gifted that much but there was a process of that restoration and god in a sense here is restoring israel through this process you know of chastisement you know allowing the enemy come in to take them so that they cry out to the lord and say okay you know we got it now we'll stop and we're going to turn to you and we're going to trust in you and you know and so forth and then that's where god wants to bring them their point some people get to that point and some people don't i remember years ago um I had to, uh, in a sense, disfellowship with somebody as a a relative. And because of that disfellowship, that individual uh, really wanted my fellowship and my family's fellowship. And so they were willing to give up this relationship that they had for that fellowship. And it worked. It literally worked. They gave it up. And then we were restored. We came right back in. And we just loved the individual to death. It's, that's what God's word said to do. And so we did it as hard as it was. A lot of people didn't like it that supposedly were Christians, you know, and so forth. But it worked. It worked when, when, it, when it's applied properly. So his, pur- his purpose is to pluck them out and return them and have compassion on them. And it shall be if they... That is, the enemy will learn carefully the ways of my people to swear by my name as the Lord lives as they taught my people to swear by Baal. Then they shall be established in the midst of my people. But if they do not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, says the Lord. Um, He's talking about Babylon there. And, And just like Babylon took Israel and cause them to worship their gods god says i will take this gentile nation this heathen nation and if they humble themselves and they worship me then i will receive them into the household and we know that through paul the apostle you know he went through to the gentiles so now we come to chapter 13 and like uh in ezekiel and isaiah God asked Jeremiah to do something unusual here. And so the Lord uh, tells Jeremiah to take a sash and to go and hide it in the rocks. A sash was a a rope or some sort of uh, uh, material that he w- you would wrap around your waist to hold your, your garment together. Verse 1, thus the Lord said to me, go and get yourself a linen sash and put it around your waist but do not put it in water. And and so go get a new linen sash and put it around your waist. And and he would walk through town. You can kind of see him walking through town and uh, the old King James uses the word girdle you know, around your waist. And he's walking through town and people notice, oh, you got a new belt there, Jeremiah. Yes, I got a new belt. The Lord told me to put a new belt on. And, you know, and he'd walk through town and they'd look at his belt and some people look up and down at his belt. You know, kind of like today when you look at somebody, especially the ladies, you know, and they see a, a lady, they want to look up and they want to look down at their shoes and see what kind of shoes they're wearing, you know, and then look up again and see the dress. You know, my granddaughters do that because they're girls and they always want to see what other people are wearing. Um, when my granddaughters were were young enough to speak, they would then start talking to my wife, Virginia, and start asking her, what dress are you wearing and what shoes are you wearing? And, and I like that outfit and you should wear those shoes with that outfit and, and so forth, you know. So they were looking at, at the outfits. Uh, just people do that. And so they were probably looking at Jeremiah with the new belt around his waist. And so I got a sash according to the word of the Lord and put it around my waist. And the word of the Lord came to me the second time saying, take the sash that you acquired, which is around your waist and and arise and go to the Euphrates and hide it there in a hole in a rock. A little unusual. Now take it and go out there to the Euphrates and find a hole where there's a rock or so forth. And I want you to take that sash and throw it in there, you know, and cover it back up with, with the rock. So I went and I hid it by the Euphrates as the Lord commanded me. Kind of strange, huh? Like I, I just got a new leather belt. And now the Lord wants me to take it out to Palm Desert and, you know, stick it in the ground and leave it there. Okay, well, what's going on here? <laughs> Why would I do that? 
Now it came to pass after many days that the Lord said to me, Arise, go to Euphrates, and take from there the sash which I commanded you to hide there. Then I went to Euphrates and dug, and I took the sash from the place where I hid it, and there was the sash, ruined, of course. It was profitable for nothing. And so you get this picture, right? A beautiful, nice sash. Then it goes, gets buried, and you go back and you, you take it, and it's like, you know, well, it's ruined now. It's got holes in it. You know, the, the bugs have probably been eating it. You know, the weather's kind of destroyed it, whether the heat or, or, or water and so forth. And so it's kind of like, now, now I can't wear it. Uh, you know, I've got nothing to wear with this, you know, except for maybe uh, a harvest carnival, you know, and go as a, a bum or something. I don't know. You know, so he's got this in his hand. So God then explains, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, In this manner I will ruin the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people who refuse to hear my words, who follow the dictates of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and worship them, shall be just like this sash, which is profitable for nothing. And we talked about that last week uh, following your own heart uh, that famous phrase you know i follow my heart where my heart leads me as long as you're following your heart and that is so far from biblical truth to follow your own hearts we need to follow the lord jesus christ you know he's written his word for us and his word is is pertains to life and godliness and we should follow his word more than anything else uh, the Bible is so clear on that. Uh, man shall not live by bread alone, Jesus said, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then we come along and we read something that God says for us to do, and we go, yeah, but. And we add a but in there when there is no but in there. And, and that's where we run into trouble and we get our butts kicked because we go after our own ways and our own ideas and so forth you know and exactly what god says i will chastise you i will chastise you don't get to the point where your heart becomes hardened because you can only ignore something so long before god then does something bigger if you're his child he will chastise you and it's not pretty at times I've seen it affect people. And if you're playing that game like, well, I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to do it my way. Eventually, God will catch up to you. And he's going to let you do it for a while because he's hoping that you'll, by your own free will, choose to do the right thing. But if not, and if you're his child, he, he will come and he'll take a belt to you. you know, and he'll allow things to happen. And then you'll be like the children of Israel here. Look at what it says. For as a sash clings to the waist of a man, verse 11, so I have caused the whole house of Israel, the whole house of Judah to cling to me, says the Lord, that they may become my people for renown, for praise, and for glory, but they would not hear. Now he gives another picture. Therefore you shall speak to them this word. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, every bottle shall be filled with wine. And they will say to you, do not, or do we not certainly know that every bottle will be filled with wine? In other words, it's kind of like, we know that. We're prospering. Everything is fine. We're doing the right things. Then you shall say to them, thus says the Lord God, or the Lord, behold, I will fill all the inhabitants of this land, even the kings who sit on David's throne the priests, the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with drunkenness. And I will dash them one against another, even the fathers and the sons together, says the Lord. I will not pity nor spare nor have mercy, but will destroy them. Hear and give ear. Now, hear and give ear. In other words, he's saying, listen to me and give ear. Now, he's not saying, listen, listen. What he's saying is, listen to me, but give ear. In other words, yield to me. Obey me before it's too late. Do not be proud, for the Lord has spoken, verse 16, give glory to the Lord your God before he causes darkness and before your feet stumble on dark mountains. Um, the dark mountains is a reference to death itself because many will die. 
And while you are looking for light, he turns it into the shadow of death and makes its dense darkness. What they were saying was, look, we know the bottles are filled. We, we, we're prospering. We're okay. Uh, we know what we're doing. We're living in sin. Uh, and all of a sudden, when we die, we'll be okay uh, because we're righteous. And we're going to die. So, so they want to live a, a sinful life, but then they want to die in righteousness, in a, in a sense. You know? And people do that. Well, I'll just live this life, and then when I die, and get, you know, when I'm ready to die, I'll just call out on the Lord, you know, and, and everything will be fine. And that's not the way that we should be living. But if you will not hear me, God says, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears. Because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. Say to the king and to the queen mother, humble yourself, sit down, for your rule shall collapse the crown of your glory. And you can read in chapter 24 of Second Kings concerning those kings. It's a reference there to those kings that he's talking to. The cities of the south shall be shut up <clears throat> or sieged and No one shall open them. Judah shall be carried away captive, all of it. It shall be wholly carried away captive. Lift up your eyes and see those who come from the north. Where is the flock that was given to you, your beautiful sheep? What will you say when he punishes you? For you have taught them to be uh, chief trains, to to be heard, heard over you, will not... Pain sees you like a wo- woman in labor, pangs. And if you say in your heart, why have these things come upon me? For the greatness of your iniquity, your skirt have been uncovered, your heels made bare. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard hit spots? Uh, then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. Now, <clears throat> In verse 22, he's describing what they're saying in their their hearts. Why have these things come upon me? They're at the point where they think they're all right and that they're making proper decisions and they're living righteously. Now, all along, they are not. They're into idolatry, they're into fornication, they're into adulteries and so forth, and they're living that way, but they think it's okay. Kind of a picture of a church today, the church today who agrees with, with uh, same-sex marriage, who agrees that homosexuals can be pastors of churches and, and so forth, and they think they're okay. And when they die, they're going to die righteous and go to heaven. That's what they think. They think God is that loving. And God is that loving, but He also judges sin. And you have to judge sin. And so they're surprised. That, that, that is the fruit of, of deceptiveness, is a surprise. What? <laughs> Why is this happening to me? Why am I going through this? You know, kind of like, I haven't done anything wrong, yet I have to suffer. It's not my fault that I'm going through all of this. And that's where their, their heart is at. Why are these things coming upon me? Well, it's because you are reaping what you sow. It's because you have made bad decisions. It's because you're living the wrong way. It's because you're not obedient. I mean, there's all those reasons why it's coming upon you. You know, we have to ask ourselves, I think, a couple of questions when we go through things. One is, what is God trying to teach me? Me, not my spouse, uh, not my friend. You know, what is he trying to teach me first? Uh, And and Lord, really, show me what it is that you're trying to teach. Don't just ask yourself, get on your knees, and you need to open my eyes and show me where I'm at fault here, where I need to to change so that I can change um, whatever it is that you're trying to work out in me. Because I don't want to just walk in deceptiveness and be deceived by the enemy and my own lifestyle. 
when the children of Israel would offer up sacrifices in the Old Testament, they always had an offering for, for the um, unknown sin. There was an unknown sin. So they knew their sins and they would confess their sins. They'd lay their hands on, on the sheep and confess their sins as a nation, as the priest would do that. Then they would confess their own faults and so forth and iniquities. But then they'd also have a sacrifice for those sins that I don't even know that I do. And there are those sins that we don't know that we're doing. I oftentimes will ask my wife, correct me, if you see me doing something, let me know so I know that I'm doing something that's not right or, or you know, and so forth. It's a habit, and it's such a habit that I don't even know it's wrong because it's such a habit. I'm so used to it that it just, uh, it's just a, a reaction and so forth. And we have to be that detailed with the Lord because we want to be cleansed completely. We want to be pure before Him. We're going to be open in every way so that when things happen, we don't say, why has this come upon me? You know, is my heart cleansed, Lord? Is there something there? And I need to pray about that. And if there is, I need to change it. So he says, for the greatness of your iniquity, and so your skirt has been uncovered. Um, because of their sexual sins, what God has done here is that he literally allowed Babylon to take them. And, and when Babylon took them, they stripped them of their clothes and they actually made them walk for miles naked, exposing themselves. And so the shame of all of that. It's interesting how the influence of evil can come into a life and just direct us in a wrong direction. Yeah. So simple, so subtle and yet it can grab a hold of you and entangle you into itself and it's always hard to get out of that sinful life once you're in it remember years ago uh, somebody was talking about the brain i was reading an article and they're talking about the brain and how it works and how we create patterns in the brain we create habits and so forth uh, of certain actions that we do and it's like a little little path that it creates and it's if it's something that's pleasurable and gives you pleasure it creates that little path and every time you do it 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 just runs over that same path and that path gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and so the more that you do it the deeper that path gets and it becomes a part of you you can't just get rid of it because that path has already been created and that's how sin is it just takes hold of you Um, there's no way out of it and in fact, I'll venture to say that you can't get out of it. And there are some sins that will overcome you. And there's no way out of those sins. The only way to get out of it is really to, to be born again. Become a new creature in Christ Jesus. If you're in a sin and you have a habit of doing things, then you are not appropriating the power that God has given unto you through the Holy Spirit. If you're in a sin and you can't get out of it, then it is because you're not born again. You're not a new creature in Christ Jesus. Virginia has a pig. And periodically, she will take this pig, Wilbur, only boy animal we have, and she will clean it. She's got a little brush and she will get soap and just scrub them, scrub them, scrub them, scrub them, you know, because they get flakes, they get dirty because they love the mud and they love all that filth and they dig their nose into the ground and trying to find whatever food they can and she will scrub them and scrub them you know clean his nose off really good with this thing it looks bright pink you know and he's all cleaned up and she brings him into the kitchen and he lays there in his little bed there in the kitchen it's about this big now (laughs) his name is Wilbur and just he loves to be scratched on his tummy you know and he's all clean he rolls over till his tummy's exposed huge tummy you slap him on it just really like this and he just like he loves that you know but something funny happens. As soon as we open up the screen door and he goes outside, he goes straight for the dirt and the mud. And he starts digging, starts turning around, getting all dirty again. Why? Because that's his nature. He just does that because he's a pig. And you can't make a pig stay clean. No matter what you do, a pig is a pig and he's going to go right back into it. And so is an unregenerated soul. When it is unregenerated, when it's not born again, when, when, when God has not come into the heart, you can't make that person clean. You just can't. 
You can't force them to do certain things. That's why I disagree with um, Christians thinking they can force society to follow certain moral values. I think we need to have them there, you know, as as laws and so forth. But I think we need to understand they're they're not going to follow them because they don't know how, nor do they have the power to follow those moral values because they're pigs, you know, they're unregenerated souls. And until they become born again and new creatures in Christ Jesus, they just don't have the power to do so. That's when you have the power to do so. That's when all of a sudden your eyes are open and you go, wow, that is so wrong. And boy, have I been offending God this long. I'm not doing that anymore. And God gives you this strength to just deny yourself completely from that. He gives you the strength to say, All these friends of mine that I've gone out drinking and taking drugs and partying with, man, was that leading me to hell. My eyes are open and I see them all burning in damnation and I don't want any part of that anymore. And God gives you this strength to say, I'm not going with them anymore. You know how many people love their friends? They will stick with their friends and they've been friends for a long time. The only thing that can pull you away from that is being born again, loving God more than your friends, being able to say, I don't need that anymore. I don't need to drink. I don't need to take drugs anymore. Now I need to learn how to love. And we had our first boy at, at 15, 16 years old. I had no idea how to be a parent, no idea whatsoever. I'm 16 years old. I was running cross country and going to high school. And now I've got this kid and you want me to raise this kid. Virginia knew more than I did. Um, She was more mature. And I left it up to her. I left it up to her completely to, to raise our boys. But when I became a Christian, I realized something, that I was the head of my home. And so I decided as the head of my home, as the priest of my home, as the man that God has called me to be to lead my family into the kingdom of God and in righteousness and in moral values that God has established for us, I decided I was going to learn everything that I could on how to do that. Now, you have to understand, you're talking, to, talking about a person who hated school, that, that failed all his classes, got straight A's in, in PE, by the way. I mean, love sports. But all the other classes were D minuses. That close to an F, but they wouldn't give me an F because then I wouldn't graduate. So they made sure I graduated. And I hated reading. Never picked up a book in my life to read. The Bible was the first book that I picked up and being that big, read through the whole thing, which is pretty amazing for me. Because just looking at a book that big, I'm going, there's no way I want to read that. I don't even want to attempt to read it. But read through it within six months. Because God got a hold of my my heart. And so I knew I have to be a father. I have to be a husband. How do I do that? And so I just started reading. Well, of course, the Bible gives you a lot of examples of that. But I just started reading books, listening to Dr. Dobson, you know, and and picking up all of these uh, radio stations that talk about family and various things. And that's where I learned everything that I needed to learn to raise my children. And so I started daily devotions. I started, you know, prayer. I started Bible studies, you know. I got rid of things in our homes that would bring us down as a family that were reminders of sin and so forth. I had a whole cabinet of alcohol. I had some cherry, which which, good stuff. And and I got all the kids together and we just started pouring it all down the drain. And and they remember... smelling it and going that stinks i go that is sin it stinks and it will destroy you and kill you if you even go down that path and so i did everything i could to learn that why because i wanted to know because god came into my life and he changed my direction and changed my perspective that i knew i had to live a godly life and a life set apart for him for him And that type of life leads you to service in his kingdom. It really does when you set yourself apart like that. A pig will return to its own natural habitat. And that's why men will never 
live up to the moral values that God has set because they're not born again. And if you're not born again, you need to be born again. You need to give your heart to God and ask Him to come into your heart and take hold of you as you make Him your Lord and Savior. And I say Lord, meaning you are my Lord, I am your servant, and I will do everything that you direct me to do. And you watch what He does to your life. He will bless you beyond measure. He goes on in verse 24, Therefore I will scatter them like stubble that passes away by the wind in the wilderness. This is your lot, the portion of your measures from me, says the Lord, because you have forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. Therefore I will uncover your skirt over your face that your shame may appear. I have seen your adulteries and your lustful desires. The lewdness of your harlotry, your abominations on the hills, in the fields. Woe to you, O Jerusalem. Will you still not be made clean? In other words, will you not still come to me? I posted, I saw something on Facebook and then I reposted it. And all it says, it says is, I saw that. And it is, underneath it says, God. I, I just loved it so much. I mean, it's just like, what? Well, because he sees everything. I thought, I'm going to put that on there. And if someone all of a sudden reads it, and like, oh, he saw me right now. I saw that. God sees what's in our hearts. He sees it. He sees everything. You're not fooling anyone. You, know, you can't fool God. You can't fool God at all. He wants our hearts, and he wants our hearts clean before him. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, then tonight, let me give you an opportunity to come to know him. And it's very simple. It's so simple, it's so profound, but yet it's so powerful when it's sincerely from the heart. And that is that you acknowledge that Christ was born of a virgin, that he walked among us, and that they crucified him upon the cross. And in three days, he resurrected from the dead. If you believe that with all your heart, then you need to confess him as your Lord and Savior. And ask Him to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And you'll be born again. And then allow Him to change your life by reading His Word and obeying it. That's simple.